Right. Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Wednesday, September 7th, 2022. I'm delighted to be here with Brian Bihar. Brian, it's great to be with you. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me, David. Brian, to start, would you tell me your title here at Caltech? Uh, I am the campus arborist here at uh, Caltech. Now, do you have a sense, does that title precede you? Have there been arborists in the past or are you the first? Um, yeah, so uh, the job title when I was hired was tree care specialist. And so that didn't necessarily mean that there were certified arborists in my position before. In fact, uh, as far as I know, um, there were certified tree workers and just very experienced tree workers uh, in, in my role before I joined Caltech. Um, but currently I am uh, an ISA certified arborist and a tree risk assessor. And to my knowledge, I'm the first one in my role to have both of those uh, titles. Brian, tell me a little bit about the education, what it takes to get certified in this field. Well, um, I'm certified through the ISA, uh, which is uh, the International Society of Arboriculture. Um, that organization is an international organization that certifies arborists worldwide. Um, in order to become an ISA certified arborist, you need to demonstrate a comprehensive uh, knowledge of all manners of the industry, um, whether it's planting, uh, tree diagnosis, tree health care, climbing, appraisal, um, soil, soil science and soil hydrology, um, basically any, everything having to do with trees, you have to demonstrate a comprehensive knowledge on. You also have to meet a minimum amount of years to even qualify to apply for the exam. Uh, once you uh, take the exam and pass the exam, uh, you have to, in order to remain certified, you have to continuously take CEUs, which are continuing education units in order to remain certified. Ryan, I'll ask a general question about Southern California and then a specific one to campus. I'm from the East Coast. It rains at the East Coast. Our yes. trees need rain. I come here, Pasadena, Los Angeles generally. It's green and yet there's no rain. I don't get it. What's going on? Can you please explain this for me? Uh, what's going on is a tremendous amount of effort and planning in order to support our urban forest. And so um, something you'll notice on campus and perhaps you'll notice more broadly in more, um, let's say affluent neighborhoods is that they have a robust and developed tree canopy. Um, this is for a variety of reasons uh, and we can get into that later, but um, uh, uh, we on campus have allocated a lot of resources to developing uh, healthy and large trees and uh, some um, communities that have the resources to support and fund an urban forestry department uh, can do the same. Um, unfortunately, there is historically a lot of communities and cities and neighborhoods that don't have uh, as robust uh, uh, set of resources in order to support an urban forest. And so circling back to your question, um, yeah, it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of planning, and it certainly takes a lot of water too. Uh, something that we is growing more and more precious every year. Now I'll ask that question specific to campus. Here we are in the middle of what seems like a record-breaking drought. What's important to you both in terms of keeping our campus green, but also operating within the spirit of sustainability? That's, you know, that is a tightrope that we, we are continuously uh, trying to walk. Um, so first I'll say, and uh, perhaps I'm a bit biased, but our trees are critical infrastructure. Um, some, something they're generally, uh, trees are generally overlooked. They're ornamental, they're cosmetic. Um, they're often, you know, when budget cuts happen, they're sometimes the first things to be cut out of the budget because again, they're not seen as essential. Uh, I would contend quite the opposite. In fact, in order to create a healthy, uh, both um, physically and also socially and uh, mentally healthy environment, we need to have a well-developed canopy. Um, uh, trees are do so much for us, not just physically, but also mentally, as I said. Um, they cool us down, especially in the heat of the summer. They transpire water further cooling the immediate air around us. Um, they are 
super important for us to uh, uh, allocate resources toward. And the issue right now with sustainability is that having faced these uh, water restrictions on campus because of the drought, we are having to shut off uh, or limit severely uh, our landscape watering. Um, the problem is, is that many of our trees are located in those turf areas and are either in part or directly watered by that turf water, um, that turf irrigation, I should say. And so when you cut off the water to what's deemed as non-essential turf, you're also severely limiting the um, uh, resources for the trees that are planted in that turf. And trees, as you know, they take generations to accumulate in value to get larger. In fact, they're probably the only piece of infrastructure that does gain in value uh, as it ages. And so it like, to, again, circling back to your question, you know, it is a bit of a tightrope to, you know, you know, trying to conserve water as much as possible while still trying to retain that um, value that we have in our ecosystem, our little mini biome here on campus. I'll ask a question in the way of, if you had a blank canvas that you were working with, there were no trees on campus. Would you go all native at this point? Would that make your life easier? Would that make the most sense? Or is there something to be said for having non-native species for all of the benefits that they confer? Ah, uh, man, I absolutely love this question. Uh, this is actually a very contentious issue uh, in our industry right now. Um, I started off my career as a native landscaper, taking out turf, taking out uh, non-natives and planting California natives. and doing that and volunteering at the California Botanic Garden, which was once uh, called the Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden, which specialized in California natives, I sort of became radicalized. Uh, and I would prefer, um, I, I was like a bit of a zealot for uh, California native plantings. Uh, since developing my career and gaining experience in the field and experience in working in urban environments, I've come around completely on this issue. Uh, the truth is there are a lot of purists uh, in our industry who have their heart in the right place and say like we only need to plant natives uh, here uh, in our uh, in our neighborhoods in our communities. Um, the problem is that uh, well there's our, there's a number of problems and I'll go through them. Uh, number one, our environment isn't native any longer. Uh, our urban environment is filled with, structures, utility lines, uh, impermeable surfaces. Uh, our neighborhoods are not the same kind of microclimate that trees that preceded us here were growing in. Um, furthermore, uh, we don't live in a natural forested area. Uh, there's only a, a small handful of native shade trees that existed here before we were here. And you know, as a urban planner, as a city forester, as an urban forester, actually, I should say, um, it's really critically important that you maintain a certain amount of biodiversity in your urban forest. Um, this is because uh, if you only planted, you know, five or so native species here, you're essentially inviting, uh, which would, you know, in effect be a monoculture, uh, you'd essentially be inviting um, uh, infestations of pests, both native and non-native, to completely wipe out your ecosystem. And so we need, we observe a what's called a 10-20-30 rule in our urban forest, which is 10, no more than 10% uh, of one species, no more than 20% of one genus, and no more than 30% of one family in any give, uh, given uh, urban forest. And so um, I think that native plantings should uh, and need actually to play a critical, if not central role in our, uh, in, in our uh, urban forest to be um, something of little oases for our native uh, pollinators and our native plants and uh, our native uh, insects and other wildlife. But they can't be the only answer um, in our urban forest. Are you dealing with water restrictions on campus? Is there a certain amount of cubic meters or whatever the measurement is that you have to stay within? Oh boy, are we. Um, I couldn't give you the hard numbers of what, uh, what the uh, certain amount of foot acres of water that we're allotted uh, weekly, 
but it's fairly draconian. Uh, we are at this point, we're only allowed to water once per week and we're permitted to hand water our trees um, throughout the week. But having said that, we run a very small crew and there's a mountain of work for us. And so we simply don't have the resources or time to go around watering thousands of trees that we have on campus. And so we're trying to focus our effort on our most valuable and our most vulnerable trees, hand watering and also putting in lots of mulch to sort of uh, retain some of that soil moisture around the trees. But it is, it is been an uphill battle since the beginning of the summer. Actually, it's been an uphill battle these last few years and it's only getting harder and harder. And some of our most valuable oldest species are, are on the verge of decline, if not already in irreversible decline. And who sets those limitations? Obviously, we want to save those trees. It's very important to give them the water that they need. Who is making those decisions about you know, essentially life or death for, for, for some of our precious trees on campus. Um, you know, that's a little above my pay grade. Uh, I, 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 I've been handed down these restrictions, um, from above, uh, from our, our directors, uh, and, uh, and certainly, you know, there is a lot of negotiation, a lot of compromise that went into it. We of course, uh, do need to conserve water as much as possible. Um, all of us have to play our role in saving this precious resource that we have that's dwindling year after year. And so um, I understand uh, that this is a critical venture in conserving water. Um, and I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm working within the confines that I'm handed down. So I don't have any direct uh, um, say in who is actually making these uh, decisions. I think, you know, a, a lot of these decisions are passed down from the city, from municipalities, from the, uh, the Department of Water and Power, and from inside our own campus, uh, from our sustainability department to our facility operations. Um, there's a lot of people who are, are contributing and, and making compromises in that, in that way. And are you going off of the assumption that because of climate change, because of the things that we're dealing with in Southern California, that these challenges are only going to become more critical over time. 100%, 100%. In fact, this is something, anytime you work within a historic institution like this one, there's a lot of pride and there's a, a certain um, aesthetic, I should say, um, that we need to preserve. You know, being a historic institution, there is a lot of, um, um, there's an ongoing transformative process, let's say, you know, like, you know, we uh, certainly want to become, we want to be an appealing place for people to visit, for people to work. And a lot of that has to do with preserving a lot of our green. Um, also, but at the same time, we have to plan for the future. Uh, you know, if this is literally the coolest summer that we'll ever have again in our lifetimes, then we need to plan for the future. That's planting species that are more climate adaptive, that's augmenting our old irrigation infrastructure, which is a whole another uh, you know, mountain that we have to climb to because we certainly have a lot of it. And, um, and it's planning for the future, it's making repairs where you can, it's putting out fires left and right, honestly. Well, Brian, let's go back to childhood. Were you always interested in trees? And did you know that there was such a thing as an arborist, a career like this to pursue? Uh, well, you know, like many kids, I, I certainly climbed my uh, share of trees. I was always playing outside and, 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 and loving to be in nature. But uh, honestly, uh, I didn't know very much about trees. I didn't know what an arborist was. I didn't know that there was a role for people like me in the, in the um, in the industry, or that there was an industry at all. And so, yeah, definitely not. Uh, growing up, I, I honestly, I think that you know a big issue for me personally was uh, you know I wasn't a particularly good student. Uh, I was maybe a straight C student going through high school, went into college, must have changed my major half a dozen times. Uh, I dropped out of college and I, I was just working as, you know, in the service industry. It wasn't until I decided to go back and, and try a couple of new things that in my junior college at the time uh, that I took my first botany class. And that was really where it all started for me. Uh, botanical science is incredibly fascinating. 
and so uh, that's where it all started for me. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Southern California, all around uh, uh, La Puente, Baldwin Park, uh, Glendora, Chino Hills, just kind of bouncing around, but you know, within the same 50 mile radius. Brian, in the way that you, as you alluded to earlier, connect trees with broader social justice issues about wealthy areas and not so wealthy areas and some of the obvious differences in terms of canopy cover, did your own background or the kind of places you saw growing up influence this perspective? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I, my parents, uh, well, my grandparents were all were immigrants. Uh, they worked really difficult, long, laborious uh, jobs. Uh, I grew up in a primarily uh, Hispanic uh, community. Uh, there wasn't a lot of infrastructure in, set in place uh, to develop uh, a nice urban canopy. And so the few trees we had in our neighborhood growing up were, we were small, they were stressed, you know, and we had to go to the, nice, the nicer areas. We had to take our bikes and go to the nicer areas to really enjoy the outdoors. And, you know, that's a shame because, you know, there's not really that much difference in the actual land and area as far as climate wise between a certain neighborhoods and certain other, you know, neighborhoods that have a lot more resources. And, you know, what does that mean exactly to have more resources at the infrastructure level? I mean, rain goes where it goes. It doesn't care what the zip code is. What are the infrastructure differences that make wealthy areas greener than poorer areas? Well, historically, there is a process called redlining, and that's where uh, uh, city planners would sort of segregate certain areas that were primarily made up of um, um, minority communities uh, or low income areas. These communities historically were underserved. Uh, they, uh, there was a lot of uh, circumstances that made investment in these communities um, difficult, if not impossible. Um, whereas uh, affluent areas and communities had the resources and urban planning to a lot for more green space. There was a, a lot more room for them to, you know, in between structures, in between houses, the acreage per house was, uh, you know, significantly larger. And when you have a lot more space, you can afford and, and to both plan and maintain um, for years, uh, green spaces and these green spaces, when you know cared for and meticulously maintained, will develop into what we see today. You know, large urban trees that you know have tremendous amounts of, of positive effects and add to property values as well. It's sort of a, a self-feeding cycle. In poorer communities, uh, you have a lot less space or spaces at a premium. So you know, buildings and structures and hard space are more tightly clustered together. That doesn't leave a lot of room for trees to develop. Um, and when there is any money or, uh, you know, to a lot towards uh, infrastructure in these poorer neighborhoods, uh, urban trees are probably the last thing on the list that receive the attention that they so, uh, they so need. Ryan, from that botany class that you took and you, you, you got the bug, you wanted to do something in this field. From that one class and discovering this interest, what did you do next? Well, uh, at the same time I was uh, going back to college and taking botany, uh, I just so happened to be a recreational rock climber. I was really into climbing. And I remember one day, it was one day and I, 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 it, it changed everything. Uh, I had volunteered on a farm uh, to do some, um, some veg management, uh, some brush clearing. Um, and they had a team of volunteer tree climbers come out to work a number of trees that had been, you know, had been neglected for many years. And when I saw those guys gearing up, getting their harnesses on, getting the ropes up and getting to the trees, swinging around with chainsaws and, and shouting. And, and it was, it was just an eye opening moment for me. I knew then and there that I knew the very moment, this is what I want to be. This is what I want to do. You know, and I was into my like, you know, mid twenties at that point. You know, so, you know, a lot of people are forced to decide their career paths early on in their, their lives or right out of high school. I was fortunate enough to, to be able to not lock myself into a certain career path too early. And now I'm doing a job that I just absolutely love and, I, and I'm well tailored to. And so, 
yeah, it was that moment that I, I, I really, uh, the light went off. It was the rational union between my, the thing I was studying and the thing I was doing on my free time, you know? Were there mentors, professors, older people in your life that gave you some advice about the best path to take, both in terms of education and certification, but also becoming um, an apprentice, getting experience out in the field? Absolutely. Um, I owe so much of uh, my career path to just a handful of individuals, teachers, um, other arborists, other industry professionals that have helped guide me uh, toward uh, the career path I have today. Uh, and I, myself, I tried to, to take that energy and that time and that effort that they put into my life guiding me into our new hires here at Caltech. I'm trying, uh, as a member of the Fed Council, that's the Facility Engagement Develop and Development Council, I am uh, trying to you know, guide our new hires back into certification programs and collegiate programs that help them uh, you know, further their education in the horticultural industry. And uh, hopefully I'm kind of trying to you know, pay it forward a little bit, you know, in the way, in, in the way it was paid to me when I was still asking my questions and I was kind of clueless coming out of my botany and horticulture classes. So what did you do next, both in terms of getting the experience and getting the education? So coming out of, uh, I, I, I went on to get a degree in horticultural science and I got a job at Disneyland Resort in California Adventure as a tree climber. Um, the, the reason I was able to do that was uh, one of my old professors back at my junior college happened to be on the staff there. Uh, it was an adjunct professor at the college and happened to have a, a position at Disneyland. And she um, uh, offered me the job. I happily took it. And uh, yeah, I became a, a tree climber at Disneyland, something that <laughs> was absolutely surreal to do. Uh, if, I, if I told myself as a child that I would be try uh, climbing trees in the middle of Disneyland, the same trees I walked underneath as a kid, uh, I would just be like, wow, I, I made all the right choices. <laughs> Brian, from that experience, what did you learn about native and non-native species? Because Disneyland wants to create an atmosphere where you could be anywhere, right? What did you learn in that regard? Well, uh, it takes a tremendous amount of effort. Uh, that's the biggest lesson I took uh, from Disneyland is, the, you know, the magic of Disneyland is all the work that goes in from all the workers, the, you know, everyone from, you know, landscapers, gardeners, arborists, uh, you know, to custodians and, and, and food workers, you know, that's the real magic of Disneyland. And so to answer your question about natives versus non-natives in, 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 a, in a place like Disneyland, um, there is certainly a push to sort of embrace the California aesthetic, to take pride in uh, our native landscape but, you know, that also has to be weighed against, you know, um, trees that grow lushly, um, that uh, provide tons of shade. Uh, you know, those are generally tropical trees and trees that don't do well naturally in our climate. And so they similarly require a great deal of planning, effort and maintenance to preserve. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's a difficult and I. I, I I presume that, you know, the landscape of Disneyland will be completely changed in the next 50 years because even, you know, like some of our most lush species that we like to plant in some of our, you know, our, our uh, in areas like Disneyland just won't be able to withstand uh, the climate as it changes. What was Disney's approach both to irrigation and hand watering? What was manual and what was automated because the infrastructure was there? Well, I should say, uh, Disneyland has a tremendous amount of resources at, it, at their disposal. Uh, we had, we had, there was no, when I worked there, which was about, mm, gosh, 12, 13 years ago now, uh, water restrictions weren't so draconian, you know, though there, we were in, uh, in effect, a drought, you know, uh, the, the restrictions weren't really in, in as in place there were you know like the industry is still evolving you know we're we're trying to retrofit a lot of our overhead sprayers to drip irrigation you know there's a lot of uh, uh you know uh, re uh reclaimed water uh going on uh in 
both Disneyland and in our communities as well. And so we're having to cope piecemeal with the realities of a changing climate. And so within Disneyland, I would expect that, you know, like they're continuously innovating. They're continuously, you know, flush with resources to, you know, to preserve, you know, their great, you know, their landscape and their trees. And, you know, so I, I you know, unlike a lot of places, I think that Disney can, can make do. <laughs> What did you learn about safety considerations? Obviously, Disneyland is teeming with people. How do you care for the trees in a way that you can maximally avoid any unfortunate mishaps like limbs falling and things like that? Well, that's a concern everywhere. Um, Disneyland, Caltech, you know, when I was work, uh, when I was working commercially as well. Um, that's uh, another one of those tightropes I was talking about, right? Uh, you know, on one hand, you do want a robust capacious canopy that gives a lot of shade and a lot of value to an area but you also have to be somewhat conservative with how large you can allow a tree to get um you have to have a keen eye for branch unions defects cavities uh infestations of different kinds of pests that might uh might uh, contribute to any mechanical weakness of trees and there's also a factor of the unknown you know sometimes limbs that are perfectly well attached and robust and large and don't have a lot of wind shear even those can fail you know that's that's nature that's biology you know and so you know uh you know to answer your question you know it is it's impossible to predict um you know a a failure in a tree that otherwise doesn't show any signs or symptoms but that doesn't mean that the failure is at zero you know there's always an associated risk with trees because they are living dynamic structures. So I wonder on that, in that vein, if you can walk me through looking at a tree, both at a distance and then both up close, what are the things that you've been trained to see to understand, here's an area of concern, this is something we're not concerned about, both you know, from looking at a tree from a distance of, let's say, 50 feet, and then mm-hmm. right up to, you know, right in front of your nose, where you're really getting in there and seeing what's going on. What's that process like? Well, you know, I'll, I'll start by saying it's a tremendous, it takes a tremendous amount of field experience and also it takes uh, a, an, an ongoing acknowledgement and refresher uh, in the best management practices of our industry. Uh, you, we have to continuously um, allocate our attention, our time, our resources to learning more about how trees function and how they fail. And so if I'm walking up to said tree and I'm 50 feet away, I'm immediately noticing, you know, like, first of all, I'm identifying the tree. Um, Nothing can be done until you identify the species of the tree and have some comprehensive um, understanding of its biology, its tendencies. Certain trees will look certain ways in certain times of the year. Certain trees won't look certain ways in certain times of the year. You know, a tree is deciduous or it has dead wood that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily know until you get closer up. Um, you're looking at the quality of the uh, of the canopy, its leaf coverage, its canopy distribution. Um, you're looking at limb, uh, um, limb structure, overall limb structure, how large it is, if there's any apparent lean. Uh, you're also taking into consideration all kinds of other site conditions. Is it on a slope? Is it in a confined tree well? Is it, you know, like next to a building? Is it being shaded out? Is it being, uh, is, uh, are there reflected light off of um, some building windows that might create hot spots on the tree? Um, is, how, uh, is there any dye back in the tree? Um, are there any apparent broken limbs from when you're first lo- looking up? And um, uh, how, what, kind, what is the traffic like around that tree? Is it in a nice open area or is it surrounded by hardscape where people and vehicles are, you know, like uh, emitting exhaust all the time? So these are the conditions you're looking at immediately from afar. Um, as you're getting closer to the tree, uh, you're, you're becoming, uh, you, your, your eye is trained more towards um, individual things like, you know, what is the bark looking like? Is it flaking off? Is it exfoliating in a way that it would uh, 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 point to some stress, some amount of stress for a certain species? Uh, are there cracks in the, in the bark? Uh, are they vertical or longitudinal? Uh, I mean, are, are they longitudinal or are they, are they perpendicular? Are, are they uh, parallel with the ground? Um, uh, 
you know, what is, what is, uh, are, are the leaves chlorotic? That is to say, are they yellowing or are, do they have spots on them? Are there any apparent pests that you can see on the tree as you're walking into it? Uh, and if so, are they, you know, regular native pests that are normally on these trees or are they something else that, you know, might trigger a deeper, uh, more advanced assessment, risk assessment of this tree? Are there any fruiting bodies, any funguses at the base of this tree or, or uh, along the trunk? Are there any cankers, any uh, sap extra, extradits uh, coming out of from old wounds or from non-apparent wounds in sunken areas along the tree, along the trunk rather? Um, so yeah, <laughs> I think I, I covered a lot of them. I'm sure there is even more. Now at this point in your career, have you built up a visual database in your head? Do you basically have the ability to identify most any tree species just on site? Oh yeah. <laughs> in fact, uh, it, it, this is becoming sort of a, a running joke with uh, my friends and uh, my uh, fiance as well. Stump Ryan, right? I, yeah, I, I cannot, I, ca I cannot keep my eyes out of the tree. <laughs> I, I can't pass a tree without doing a cursory visual inspection of the tree. Uh, and uh, sometimes, even while driving, I have to remind myself to keep my eyes on the road and not, you know, pay attention to that leading tree on the on the freeway embankment. You know. Uh, I've become, uh, so yeah, the more you, you know, and this goes probably for any discipline, you know, the more you, you experience and look at it, the more you all of a sudden build up this internal database where you can immediately like a, a key in to some defect, something that's just, just off about it. And then, you know, you know, and it takes a little more, you know, investigation to really come to a, an educated conclusion about the condition of this tree. Brian, let's move now to the arborist toolbox. Once you've identified all of these potential areas of concern, what are both the tools and the medicines that you're working with to keep trees healthy? Well, you know, a lot of our tools in preserving trees are go towards preventative maintenance of these trees. The number one um, Thing that you can do to, pre uh, to preserve the health of the tree is to improve uh, site conditions for these trees. You know, like uh, a lot of times you won't really know if a tree is stressed until it's well into its infestation or it, it, it well into its uh, malady, you know, so to speak. Um, so a lot of the tools that I use are, you know, like, um, for instance, I'm a tree climber. I get up in the tree, I get a a very close, intimate look at the inside and outside of the tree on a daily basis. Um, this usually happens while I'm pruning trees. Uh, a lot of people will say, you know, like, oh, you're going up there, you're, you're cutting branches, you're clearing it out. But, you know, being an arborist, you know, you really understand that you need a light touch up there. Trees have an economy of resources um, uh, uh, inside them, you know, in their branches, in their leaves. And if you annually take them off, if you take too much off, at any given moment or annually, uh, you really limit a tree's uh, ability to keep itself healthy, you know? Um, worldwide, uh, arborists are sometimes uh, uh, called tree surgeons. And I really like this, um, this title, a tree surgeon, because you're essentially doing surgery in there. And surgery, you know, on people could be a life-saving, a really beneficial thing, but if you do it too much uh and only for cosmetic reasons then you can perhaps uh, have some health complications and it's it's the same with trees as well they don't you know you so since i've been here on campus we've kind of shifted towards a less um clean and open aesthetic and more of a natural aesthetic as well and so that's my physical tools you know basically my cutting instruments my own you know um i own efforts physically as well um as far as um, medicants and other, you know, they're, the industry is always evolving. You know, we have fungicides and insecticides and other, you know, co chemical compounds, both organic and synthetic, that we use um, uh, on our trees uh, to stave off the worst symptoms of some of these infestations uh, or some of these maladies. Um, having said that, uh, chemical use is usually the last line of defense in a tree. You want to first improve the site conditions to aid a tree in responding naturally on its own 
over time uh, rather than continuously use expensive chemicals to preserve a tree, which what might only be a temporary fix. Brian, to go back to the chronology at, at Disney, what was the reporting structure? What was the group that you were in? Was there an Arbor division of Disneyland? How did that work? Yeah, uh, in fact, uh, there was about um, a dozen or so uh, tree climbers, uh, various, uh, you know, uh, a few of them were certified arborists as well. We, they also had a tree risk assessment department specifically walking around on the ground flagging trees for further investigation. Then uh, some of the tree climbers would get in and report back, you know, uh, you know, is this tree looking like it's ailing? Is this tree looking like it is, you know, uh, stressed out? And they will build a comprehensive profile of each specimen, uh, take inventory of that specimen, and make uh, recommendations based on those uh, those findings and those observations. And so it was, uh, you know, there was never anything less than a few uh, different qualified individuals looking at every specimen to confirm uh, the the health of each uh, each uh, tree that we are looking at. And is there a chief arborist who ultimately makes decisions based on those recommendations? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, there was, you know, the lead of our arborist crew, it, another certified arborist and a very accomplished climber as well. He dictated uh, uh, what our our um, our goals were for the day, for the week, uh, set out our work hours and reserved uh, work orders as well as handed down from the tree risk department, uh, risk assessment department as well. Um, there was always meetings about, you know, what to do in certain scenarios what our objectives were with certain preservations. Sometimes there's construction that we need to do uh, risk mitigation or damage mitigation uh, for certain trees. Uh, I remember when I was working in the Jungle Cruise, for instance, uh, we had to, there was helicopters flying in new animatronic animals, and we had to pull trees apart from one another and cable them apart in order to get in with the helicopters to drop off these things. It was a whole process and and and, and uh, so you know, it's a lot of moving parts at any given moment. Was there a favorite area of the park for you? A place where there were the most interesting trees, or the most interesting problems to work on? Oh, uh, that's a tough one. Uh, the Jungle Cruise was awesome to work on, but it was tough too. It was really wet and and muddy in there, <laughs> and everything. You know, I I I don't know. I'm not sure if I've mentioned this, but everything was done overnight, and so it was all in the dark. Uh, so we only had our tower lights and our headlamps to guide us through these trees. And we're climbing in the dark, we're working in the dark uh, in times where most people are asleep. And so, you know, that it's added a certain dimension of um, difficulty and challenge to the job. Um, but also it, it was uh, nice to not, you know, work around pedestrian foot traffic and other people as opposed to here at Caltech. Uh, all our, our work is done while classes are in session, while meetings are happening, while research is done, getting done. And so it's, you know, it's a, a challenge to sort of navigate um, these schedules in order to essentially operate a tree service within the campus as it's running. Brian, what did you learn first at Disney and then coming to Caltech about making that ultimate decision when a tree needed to come down? This decision is a really tough uh, tough one to make. Uh, obviously, our preference is to retain and monitor any species, any specimen, I should say. Uh, trees are tremendously valuable. They take a tremendous amount of time, generations of time in order to mature and provide all the value that we know uh, trees give us. And so ultimately, it comes down almost always to a matter of safety. Safety is our number one concern it was at Disneyland and it is at Caltech uh, with all tree work. Uh, we have to uh, preserve um, the safety of both our crews, our workers, and also our, you know, either our park goers or our, you know, Caltech community as well. It's the same everywhere. And so when you look at a tree or when we're uh, investigating a tree and doing a risk assessment, you know, we will basically pull out all the stops in order to preserve it. But ultimately, it, you know, trees are living things too, and they have their own natural lifespans and, you know, they will go into decline and they'll die off 
And when they die off, certain species are more likely to fail than others. You know, certain species like oaks, they'll probably stay up for hundreds of years, you know, even after they're dead. Uh, certain other species like liquid ambers or some of our imported species from other places in the world will, you know, develop a, a cavity at the base and will then become unstable and will fall over. And this is something that we simply don't allow. Uh, in fact, uh, we've had only in the years I've been working at both um, Disneyland and at Caltech, I've only observed a few small catastrophic failures. And given the fact that we worked on, and I personally worked on thousands and thousands and thousands of trees, you know, that's saying something. Now, did you get your certification during your time at Disney or you came in with the certification? Uh, I came in with the certification. Uh, and so actually, you know, I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't have my certification when I was working at Disneyland. Uh, I started off as a grounds worker there and then I had to prove my ability uh, and my know-how in the department uh, as a climber, as a risk assessor, as a safe worker. Um, so they didn't give me, they didn't let me up in the ropes uh, for, for all, quite a while. Um, once I did uh, demonstrate my proficiency uh, with climbing, then uh, I was able to contribute to the crew in a more meaningful way. Uh, I left Disney and started my own tree care company um, for about five years out of my community in Claremont. Um, and it was during that time uh, that I studied for and applied for and uh, passed the ISA Certified Arborist exam. What were some of your inspirations for striking off on your own, becoming an entrepreneur? Uh, well, for one, I didn't want to work overnight anymore. <laughs> that was a, that was t a tough go. Uh, I, you know, work, anybody who's worked a graveyard shift will tell you, you know, it, it, it messes with your life in a lot of ways that you won't anticipate. So even when I work in a dream job, like the one I had at Disney, uh, had a lot of challenges and a lot of obstacles and I simply couldn't, you know, I'm a morning guy, you know, I, I like to be up early in the morning and I like to, you know, be out in the sun and be out in the day. And I simply couldn't do that at Disney. So I left Disney and I, I went back with my old uh, native landscaping crew who didn't have a tree care company at the time. And I pitched this idea uh, that, you know, I would come back as the arborist for the company and eventually uh, start my own service uh, under their banner. And they, to their credit, they were super supportive of that idea. They knew my passion. They knew my proficiency. They wanted to start, instead of outsourcing their tree work to other tree companies, they wanted to do it in house. And so they gave me free reign to run the tree service under that name. And I did so for about five and a half years. And that was great. But also uh, the commercial tree care industry is absolutely fraught with non-professionals. People, anyone can get a rope and a chainsaw and call themselves a tree worker with n little to no legal, you know, uh, ramifications. Um, certainly, you know, you have to be a certified arborist in order to call yourself a certified arborist, but many people don't look for certified arborists when they're having people there, uh, work on their trees. Um, they just want somebody to come out and do it quickly, do it safely and do it cheaply. Um, I can't tell you how many times I was outbid, uh, on jobs that I was well-researched and well-prepared and, and well, and, you know, and ready to do by someone who was doing it for basically nothing. You know, they'd come in and they'd ha do a hack job on the tree. They would injure tr the tree and leave and they wouldn't come back, you know? And so, and this is, you know, I, I struggle to think of very many other industries, trade industries where a healthy, a huge significant proportion of the workforce are untrained professionals. And, but that's the, that's the reality in the tree care industry right now. I wonder how much of this is tied up with larger immigration issues and a lack of regulation. 100% it's tied into that. Um, so uh, a lot, you know, I think traditionally tree care has been sort of um, framed as a, uh, you know, low skill or no skill job. It's a tough job, very difficult physically um, to get up there and very potentially hazardous and injurious job as well. Um, but because it's a dangerous job, you know, it, it's not as appealing perhaps to educated professionals. And so you have to sort of have the right balance of, you know, fitness and physical capability to be a climbing arborist 
while being well versed, well educated in order to really uh, apply that knowledge, that technical knowledge toward tree preservation. And that's especially critical in Southern California where trees are, you know, they don't, um, they, they take a lot of care and maintenance to, to help them thrive. Brian, tell me about some of the communities you served in Claremont. Uh, well, so I lived in Claremont for about 14 years. Uh, I My job took me as uh, far east as Riverside, uh, all the way down to Santa Monica. I took jobs wherever I could, honestly, because I had to. Um, in that, you know, it, when I'm running the service, I even had to take second job as an, uh, in the evening as a server just to pay for my first job, to keep my guys employed and to, to keep them paid and keep myself, you know, afloat as well. It's super cutthroat. And so I took jobs, you know, that would barely pay off, you know, and under tight schedules too, but I never wanted to compromise quality because I felt like that was what I offered my clients. Uh, I could speak to them articulately about what I was going to do and what I plan to do. I made myself avail available to them afterwards as well. Um, so that way they, I would build a relationship. In a way, I was sort of selling myself, uh, not the actual tree work. And then I would follow up, of course, with the good tree work and they would gain trust in me. And uh, I had built up a fairly sizable uh, client base uh, by the end of those five years. Let's go through some of the ins and outs of tree climbing. First, in terms of worker safety, what are the basics? What do you need to do in order to be safe? Well. First of all, you know, safety is absolutely paramount. Uh, we have to use all our PPE, our helmets, our safety glasses. Uh, we have to do visual and routine inspections of all of our climbing gear in order to make sure that it still meets uh, uh, American National Safety Institute standards, ANSI standards. Um, we also have to retire a lot of our equipment after a certain number of years. Uh, I have gone through many ropes that were in pristine uh, condition after meticulously taking care of them for years, just because you know I you know you can't cl continue climbing on the same ropes for too long, or else you know like that. I mean that that um, violates best management practices, uh, and so you have to replace and renew and maintain all of your equipment in order to climb safely, um, and that's as a climber. Uh, but also as a climber, you have a obligation to those underneath you as well, uh, to communicate effectively with your grounds members, to make sure that they're wearing their own personal protective equipment, and to make sure that uh, you're uh, working in a safe manner and not to compromise uh, the safety of anyone else. If I make a mistake up there, if I, if I, if I am short-sighted and I, I do something wrong up there, you know, maybe I'm stuck up there. And if my ground crew put themselves in danger to come and rescue me, you know, then I'm essentially putting other people in, in danger as well. And that's, or first responders as well. You know, if, if I hurt myself, I mean, like I'm really, you know, looking after myself up there and I have to maintain a high level of safety of uh, mindedness in order to make sure that I'm coming down safely day in and day out. Brian, what about the tree itself? What are some of the do's and don'ts about not harming the tree when you have to climb it? Well, uh, you know, we were talking about untrained professionals climbing trees in the, in, or earlier, and something that is killing me when I see it is uh, uh, tree services and tree climbers using spikes in trees that they don't intend to fell. Um, spikes, of course, should be relegated only towards working trees and spars, that is, you know, trunks that are delimbed, um, for removing trees or in rescue operations when when the, the health of the tree is takes a backseat to, you know, um, you know, rescuing something or a utility, you know, uh, somebody who's hit a utility line and needs to be rescued out of there. Then of course, you know, you have to take er er every tool you have out of the bag and, and make sure, you know, to, to, um, uh, to solve the situation. Um, but yeah, it kills me when I see, uh, climbers climbing trees and, um, with spikes, making bad cuts, making flush cuts, that is, uh, making cuts on branches that are up against the trunk. Um, you know, trees have internal physical chemical barriers uh, in the canopy that, you know, if you cut a certain area, you know, they will be able to withstand any um, infestation or any new pathogen or halt the spread of decay. And so you have to be, um, you have to have an, a working knowledge 
of how best to uh, prune and work a tree to prevent the introduction of pathogens and also decay into trees. Also routine sterilization of your tools, maintaining your tools well, um, not taking too much out of a tree at once because then you can lead to a, a chronic stress of the tree as well. What were some of your proudest moments in terms of making homeowners happy? They were, you know, very scared that they would lose their tree and you came in and saved the day. Uh, well, you know, I'll say, I wish there were, I had a lot more instances in which I saved trees, but the reality in the commercial industry is that people usually won't call you to come and evaluate their tree until it's been dead for maybe some time or it's well into its uh, mortality spiral. Um, this is the reality of trees is that, you know, they will be communicating their stresses and symptoms to you for many years and you might not, you might be blind to it until your tree uh, is almost dead. Having said that, I have had a number of really great, great successes with clients where I introduced a healthcare program, a long-term healthcare program for trees, um, or I've done some restorative pruning when they had a um, uh, non-professional uh, or poor tree service come out and hack the tree and top or top the tree. That's a big one. Um, and so it takes, but it, you know, for all that harm that was done so quickly to that tree, it takes many, many years of planning and, and pruning and to restore the natural shape and natural vitality of the tree. And so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a difficult, it's a difficult thing to do to, to help a tree, but it's probably the mo one of the most rewarding parts of my job is to see something that is struggling and help it to thrive. Brian, given the large geographic area, the very diverse communities that you served during this period, is that when in your career you started thinking about ways where you could use your area of expertise for social justice, for balancing out poorer communities so that they can have better tree cover? Absolutely. I gave the same quality of care uh, to my more affluent clients than I did to ones whose resources were a lot more limited, you know, because in my view, you know, where, you know, I might, you know, have some financial stake in helping you know, more affluent clients with their trees, I had a vital social role where I can help preserve the, the value of somebody's property or help um, assuage any fears that the tree might fall and harm them, you know, or do some preventative maintenance to take, put their mind at ease and, and treat them and their trees like they're, you know, you know, uh, pristine specimens, like they're, 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 they're they're, you know, like historic specimens or something, you know, like I, I'm not just working for the people too. I'm working for the, as I, I see my role as speaking for the trees, I, for helping the trees, being the lawyer for trees, you know, negotiating on, on their behalf, on their health and helping them thrive. And in that way, I feel that I am trying to improve my environment, improve my social surroundings. And there's a little bit of kind of karma to it, right? You know, like you're, you're helping people, you're, you're helping your colleagues, you're helping, you know, your, your, your coworkers and your community and you improve the, the things around you. And, and, you know, and it, and it comes back to you in a way that may be ephemeral, you know, might be nebulous in your brain, but it, it makes me happy. It makes me happy to, to, to apply my efforts towards improving my, my world. Brian, is there a continuing education component? Do you need to take refresher courses for your certification? 100%. Uh, so in the ISA, you are, um, you're, it's mandated that you recertify every th uh, three years. Um, this uh, is, uh, you, you have a certain number of what are called continuing education units, CEUs, that you must satisfy uh, in that three-year time span. And so every time you attend a seminar, every time you attend a workshop, or you, you, or you submit a, an exam test, uh, anytime you participate in a voluntary event uh, where you're, you know, contributing your skills and know-how, uh, these uh, qualify um, for continuing education units. And so you have to be a continuously engaged professional, uh, and you need to stay aloft of the latest research and know and, and industry knowledge 
in order to maintain that uh, that certification. And I absolutely love that. I love that about a certification because if you were simply to study your, your butt off, you know, and, and, and maybe you, you study all the textbooks you and you, and you and you luck out on that exam and you just barely pass and you never think about it again, are you really truly qualified to represent us at, at the highest tier in our, in our, in our industry? Uh, I would say no. If it wasn't for the uh, this continuing education unit um, uh, requirements, I would say the the title of certified arborist wouldn't carry as much uh, professional weight as it does now. And there are other um, certifications, like for instance, I told you earlier that I'm a tree risk assessor as well. That also requires uh, recertification and continuing education units. Um, and finally, the, the 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 final top tier of our in, uh, industry is the board certified master arborist certification. This is something I'm currently working toward right now, and that will require an even higher, um, uh, an increased amount of continuing education units year after year in order to satisfy those requirements. What will you be able to do at that level that's not possible now? Good question. Uh, you know, it's I've always seen it as a personal endeavor. Uh -huh. I've always wanted to be the best arborist I can, you know? I want to be able to speak with um, some authority on, in my field uh, to convey these um, these ideas to the public to represent my trade in a way that is articulate and but also accessible as well. And I see my path toward becoming a board certified master arborist in that light. That'll help me gain some um, authoritative uh, weight behind my word. But honestly, you know, it's, it's a lifelong learning um, experience being an arborist, in my opinion, at least, you know, uh, I will be, you know, in another 50 years, you know, I will still be thinking about trees and lear learning more new things about trees that I had no about no idea about or refreshing old knowledge uh, that maybe, you know, I, I might have left back in junior college, you know, like, uh, and so I, I love refresher courses. I love going, diving back into, you know, like, um, like first year kind of tree by tree and plant biology too, because it reaffirms and it kind of strengthens, strengthens that, uh, that grasp on, on, uh, on your uh, expertise you know, those neural networks, you know. <laughs> Brian, what about conferences and conventions? Are there opportunities to to learn from peers in the field and to interact with commercial companies, suppliers, and get a sense of the latest products that are out there? Absolutely. That's actually, a, other than the educational aspect of these symposiums and conferences, I think right up there is being able to communicate and uh you know and build relationships within your professional community it's critically important that we do that because perhaps i'm running into an issue that i have very little experience in or i need a second opinion on something you know it helps me to be able to draw on not only my own uh, body of experience but also those of my peers and colleagues as well I have many, many colleagues that work in the Arboretum at the Huntington Library in municipalities around Pasadena and San Marino, in Claremont and Upland. I've built these relationships and they're so important to me. And I try my to make myself available to those people as well. If they need, you know, some help with something, some know-how, or maybe just they need another planting supervisor for a, a tree planting event or something, you know, like I, I feel like the, the more time I spend in my industry, the more I, people I get to know, the more it, it, it comes a little bit of a small world, honestly. I, I, I recognize people from back in college. I recognize people from old jobs, old colleagues, old coworkers, old employees, you know, in other positions. And, and it's wonderful to see people developing in their, their own career paths. And it is extremely useful to build those relationships, you know, uh, uh, in this industry to, you know, you know, improve my own um, body of knowledge. Brian, when the opportunity at Caltech came available, were you looking for a change of scenery at that point, or this just came out of the blue and it looked too good to pass up? A little bit of both, honestly. Uh, so I love so much about running the tree service. Um, the flexibility, 
you know, the, the fact that I was building my own name, I was putting myself out there, you know, I could choose to work for a week, I could choose to not work for a week, you know, at certain times, I was putting my all into it. It was my face, my name, everything. Um, but having said that, like I said earlier, it's a cutthroat industry. And some some months were great. There, were, I was making a lot of money. I felt like I was getting the value that I had put into the uh, to, into my my company and my my tree service. And then some months were completely destitute. I had I had little work. I was scrounging by. I was losing sleep on jobs that had to be done in a certain time uh, by a certain you know by a certain date, or else I, I wouldn't make any money. And that was a tremendous stressor on my life. And so while I'm thankful for that experience, I was, I had started opening myself up to the possibility that there was another role for me out there. And, you know, something about me is when I'm in a position in a, in a career or in a job, I'm all in, you know, I need to be all in because that's, you know, I feel like my success and my value is a function of my effort that I put in. And so, uh, you know, I think it was probably in a stretch of of of, uh, of tough times that I had gone online and, and said like, "Hey, what kind of jobs are around here? You know, what what you know what, what what can I fetch out there? What kind of opportunities can I can I find?" And that's I I, I stumbled upon the uh, job application for the tree care specialist here at Caltech. It wasn't known as Cal Campus Harvest at the time; it was just called Tree Care Specialist. And I had always had a reverence for Caltech, what Caltech represented uh, in our community, uh, what it stood for, and, and as, as an arborist, you know, as a horticultural scientist, you know, I wanted to approach my position like a scientist, using the scientific method and, and, and you know, adhering to the, you know, the, the honest assessments and self, self assessments and peer review that science kind of championed. And so I saw Caltech as this incredible, you know, institution in this beautiful area. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I have to, I have to give it a shot. Even if it's a long shot, I have to try. And, and, and so I applied, I applied to Caltech and I heard nothing back. Uh, like I, I even followed up a week later and then two weeks later, just following up on my, you know, my, on my application, my cover letter, seeing what else I can offer. If you need any more, if you have any other questions. And there, I got nothing. <laughs> and I said, okay, back back to work, back to planning my, my weekly schedule, back to everything. It wasn't for a couple months that I finally got called in for an interview at Caltech and I was elated. I was like, okay, I have a chance. I have an opportunity. I, you know, like I, I and, and I, I literally, could, I had tree brand. I couldn't sleep that night because you know, <laughs> I was so excited about, you know, interviewing. And so I had my first interview and it went so great. I was so happy to be talking about trees. This is the one thing I do probably too much <laughs> is talk about trees. And so I was thrilled to be interviewed by Delmi Emerson and Ryan Robesai, both of whom have a tremendous amount of um, knowledge, working knowledge of trees uh, being arborists as well. Uh, and so I felt like the interview went so great. I felt like I'd built a good repair for and I would represented myself well and I left thrilled. Uh, I didn't hear back did for you, months. Did you get a tour of the campus? Did you get a chance to look around at the trees on campus? I did. I did, and, and not from the interview. I had done my homework on the on the institution. I I took my bike around every every publicly accessible space around campus, building up um, sort of a mental map of the campus and maybe kind of coming up with my own like assessments of the tree work that had been done up to that point things that i loved about it things that might you know i had some you know critical assessment on you know and trying to really kind of elevate my 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 status and my you know coming into the interview but you know after that first interview not ha having heard back for a couple months i had slowly slipped into like well you know the interview was a good it was a good uh, experience. I'm glad I had this experience. I, you know, I still uh, love Caltech. And then several months later, I got my second interview, and that's where things started rolling. <laughs> Brian, from that first informal bike tour around campus, what were your takeaways? What What was campus doing well, and in what areas did the trees really need work? 
Well, I mean, one needs only walk through the campus to see that we have a very robust, well-maintained, well-preserved canopy. We have old specimen trees, rare specimen trees on campus as well, a well-developed canopy, cosmetically absolutely immaculate in a lot of ways. Um, so there was a lot to admire about you know the, the landscape coming in. They had done a tremendous job uh, up until I come in. Um, I think my criticisms of the landscaping coming in were in line with some, sort of how the industry more broadly was, sh was shifting um, from less of a cosmetic and a clean appearance to more of a natural shaping and allowing trees to kind of fill out and allowing trees to gain in capaciousness in, 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 in canopy size. And also, you know, as I mentioned before, we had a lot of trees planted in turf. Um, but now, you know, the industry is shifting away from turf and more towards mulch and, and, and ground covers and, uh, or, you know, perennial herbaceous plants as well. And so, you know, I think that my criticisms were limited, but there were important uh, distinctions from where the campus had been before and where it had to go, you know, when taking in climate change and our water restrictions into account. As part of that second interview, were the people you were talking with, were they receptive to your ideas? Did they welcome the idea that you were proactive, that you saw things in areas in, for improvement? I think that was probably what was one of the, I mean, I can't jump into their brains, but I feel like that was one thing that kind of set me apart as a candidate in that position um, was that I had developed um, my own opinions about campus, about where I wanted to go, what direction we wanted to head to. And something that always from the from that day until today stuck with me. Um, I remember my ground supervisor, Ryan Robitaille, he told me that he wanted someone who would take ownership of the trees. Uh, and ever since then, from applying to the job to working the job and being here right now, this instant, I feel that these are my trees. I take care of them because they're mine, they're my own. And, 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 and when we lose one, it hurts. And when we plant new ones, I'm excited. And I, I'm excited for what they will become. And so, uh, you know, I come on, I come on my days when I'm not working. I come to campus just to look at the trees, to enjoy the shade of those trees that, you know, just days before had kept me aloft from falling on the ground, <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. As you mentioned, you were a longtime admirer of Caltech and what it represented. Being an institution that takes the science and engineering so seriously, in what ways is that a built-in advantage for success in what you do? Can you, could, actually, I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? That so was, science and engineering are taken very seriously at Caltech, right? Yeah. And you, you, your work is dependent on, on science, right? Is there something about just the culture of Caltech that makes your job more fulfilling or easier or more impactful because of you know, your reliance on the science to do the job correctly? 100%. I mean, I feel like all of us in facilities could sort of take up that banner of, you know, the spirit of inquiry, you know, like a, a, a peer, uh, peer reviewing of all the of scientific method, all methodology. Uh, we, if we approach our jobs scientifically, we position ourselves to be able to not only um, uh, effectively address issues and, and, and obstacles and challenges, but also to learn from our mistakes, to move forward uh, to learn uh, new innovative ways in to implement those innovations into our into practice. Um, that's a big part of science and that's a big part of what we do here, even in the grounds shop. You know, like I remember uh, our, our, um, our incoming director, uh, David Kang, was telling me, uh, was telling us uh, about this uh, anecdote from NASA where, you know, uh, John F. Kennedy had come into NASA and, and he asked the custodian, what are you doing here? And he says, I'm helping put a man in the moon. And so I feel like that way, uh, you know, all of us in facilities from custodians to plumbers, electricians, groundskeepers, uh, painters, we're all helping to propel the institution of Caltech forward. Now, as for the community, it's been so welcoming. Um, there, uh, I have made 
some of my closest friends are students are, and postdocs here. Um, others uh, are faculty, uh, staff. Uh, I mean, it, it's been such a welcoming, warm community, and I'm so fortunate to uh, work here. And because I took ownership of those trees, because I know the importance of a robust canopy on our mental health, you know, I think that in some small way, I am helping to add prestige, my some little bit of prestige, you know, small increase of prestige uh, to uh, this institution. Right. If we walk around campus today, where might we appreciate, you know, your fingerprints, all of your skills, all of your experience that we can see, that we can say, this tree is here as a result of your efforts. Everywhere, every, I, and I and I and I know I say, say you want specific areas, but honestly, I've climbed and worked every single tree on and around campus. Uh, so you know, there are like like any in, uh, industry endeavor, there are failures and there are successes. Uh, you know, I think uh, there there is you know a lot of people know about the founders tree in 2016. That was before my time. But, you know, you have a tree that was probably of the utmost importance on campus. And we had a variety of experts uh, from in-house and from outside come in and evaluate this tree, tr work to preserve this tree, because it was, it was our founder's tree. It was a tree that existed as a symbol of the, of the institution. That tree died, and, and that's, but that's nature, you know? Uh, trees are not eternal ornaments. They're living and they, 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 they get stressed and they die as well. And so I have many trees on campus that I'm super proud of that we've been able to preserve and bring back from stressful times. But I got to tell you, you know, it's getting harder and harder. We have so many species on campus that were planted at a time before we really took climate change and and uh, water restrictions seriously you know maybe they weren't even thought of at the time uh classic example we have about 130 redwoods on campus uh coast redwoods are you know california icons they're our state they're our state tree um they're magnificent specimens um they're very distinctive and unique and dynamic and we love them um out of those hundred so trees that we own campus, maybe only a handful are truly healthy right now. Um, they're getting scorched year after year and they don't have, even if we were to water them intensely, you know, more than we're allotted, we still wouldn't be able to preserve them because they don't belong down here. And so it's about part the of heat my job, is what you're saying. It's the heat, it's the heat, it's the lack of water, it's the, uh, the certain pests that we have uh, that are more common down here than they are up there. Um, it's, it's a combination, it's a confluence of forces that usually leads to, to a tree's decline. We have a lot of different specimen species on campus that are not climate adapted, that are not, um, that we'll have to move away from in the future. So as much as it pains me, we're going to have to fell a lot more trees in the future. Um, that's just part of it. And we have to replace them with trees that will thrive and, or at least will be more adaptive in the future. Um, so where you see my fingerprint is everywhere. I, my, the whole campus canopy is my big, it's a big, you know, urban, you know, fingerprint. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, heavily forested areas like, or, are, 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 I mean, I'm sorry, what I mean to say is um, particularly dense areas around Throop Pond, around um, Caltech Hall, uh, behind all of our, uh, many of our, um, our faculty housing areas, you know, these are trees that have taken a lot of work to preserve, to maintain, and to, to beautify over the years. And I'm, I'm really proud of it. Brian, what do you have to say about all of the olives that we see falling on the ground in the fall? Would you like oh, to man. see them harvested? Is there a better use that we could have other than them dotting the sidewalks and the lawns? This is a, a tremendous part of our maintenance uh, year after year. And we're trying all kinds of different um, uh, remedies um, to eliminate what is essentially a nuisance fruit. So before we used to have, a, a, I, I think it was in 2015, we had a, um, a, a program to harvest the olives, to press them and create, create our own um, olive oil as well. Um, 
this, I wasn't around during that time, but I've learned a great deal about it. And the truth is, is that it was a very resource intensive process, uh, full of a lot of, you know, really, you know, enthusiastic volunteers, but that volunteership declined over time and the resources were, you know, reallocated. Um, any olives that are planted these days are a particular variety of fruitless olives. Um, so olives are great trees. They they grow. They're they're very resilient to, to drought. Um, they take a, a hard prune when they need. Uh, they bounce back very well. They're not prone to a lot. I mean, they they have their pests and their diseases as well, but not not a ton. Um, so they're really great California trees. They they're a Mediterranean climate, but they're a dry climate. So once again, they're they're drought resistant, and we love them. But um, yeah, our old olives. We've been treating them with different um, what are called uh, plant growth regulators, PGRs. And this process, there's a very tight window to treat these trees. And we have hundreds of olives, not just on Olive Walk, but all around campus and faculty housing as well. All of them producing that nuisance fruit, which stains the sidewalk. And so it's it comes down to, you know, all hands on deck. We're, we're putting all our guys out there and trying to treat these trees The even in the best case scenario, our most expensive products that we've used are about 75% um, effective. And so and it's, and it, it's an expensive process and we don't have limitless resources here on campus too. And so, you know, we try to treat the ones that are the most highly traffic area. We try to pr uh, time our pruning cycles to eliminate some of the flor flowering as well to prevent some of the fruiting. So, you know, for as much of those olives as you see on the ground, if we didn't put any effort into them, we'd literally be dry, we'd be knee deep in olives otherwise. Now, does this chemical treatment render the olives unsafe to eat? Are there warnings that people should be concerned about? Not at all, not at all. So what the synthetic PGR, the plant growth regulator does is it mimics the natural chemicals inside a tree that triggers uh, fruit senescence, that is fruit drop. And so if you can get those um, fertilized ovaries the, the, of the flowers, the tiny little olive flowers to drop before the fruit uh, actually set, then you will have effectively eliminated the fruit. The remaining fruit on there don't have any um, pesticide or, uh, or in this case, herbicidal residue or anything like that that would render, render them unsafe. Uh, once again, safety is our absolute paramount concern on campus. Uh, we don't take any chances with anything that could potentially cause um, harm to anybody passing by or even our squirrels and wildlife. We don't want them dying, you know, eating toxic fruit or anything. That's, it, that would not fly on campus. We have way too many uh, red tape safeguards in order to prevent us from doing that, and rightfully so. Ryan, for the last part of our talk, I'd like to ask two questions that look to the future. So going back to this example of the Redwoods and you thinking generations out where ultimately all of them will be replaced, what are the kinds of trees that are your go-to that will do much better in this new climate reality that we all face? That's a really great question. And we are finding out still. Um, of course, I would love to incorporate more native trees. Um, you know, we have we do have a host of native trees that do well, you know, in our climate. But these trees are not particularly good shade trees, honestly. And and shade is something we really need to bring into campus in order to keep our our you know um, pedestrian walkways uh, habitable and nice. You know, like. We want to keep the cool, you know. We want to keep the cool and 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 uh, inviting environment, for not just our students and faculty, but for visitors to campus as well. And so we need to use a combination of native trees that we haven't planted before, you know, like California buckeyes and and uh, desert willows, increasing the amount of mesquite trees and Palo Verdes, you know trees that are going to be doing well in our climate with little resources. Um, but also we want to take more seriously our introduction and import of non-native species, especially from places like uh, South Africa, Australia, Southeast Asia, areas that have um, 
really intense weather extremes uh, or otherwise have um, very dry summers. You know, I think when people think about, you know, importing non-native plants and trees, you know, rightfully so, there are some alarm alarm bells will go off in their head. You know, some red flags will be raised. Um, We have learned so much in just the, even the last couple of decades, let alone the last 50, 100 years about what trees are invasive, which trees will thrive, how to cultivate varieties that are not threatening to lo- local ecosystems. And so I think that, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, this contentious issue within our own uh, industry and more broadly in the, in the community. We certainly don't want to cause catastrophic invasive species to come in and disrupt our local ecosystems. Um, A a big example was the blue gum, the the eucalyptus, uh, which was imported heavily in the 18 and early uh, 1900s into California for a timber tree. And it grew really quickly, but also it was, it made terrible timber, timber uh, products. Uh, The the, the wood wasn't particularly good for burning, for, for, for um, cooking purposes or heating purposes. And they were prone to limb failures and introduce all kinds of non-native uh, uh, pests into our environment. And so that was a bit of a catastrophe, but we've learned so much more. And now we can import species that we know are, are, are would do great in our communities. Um, even even species, certain uh, species of eucalyptus, you know, there's 750 different varieties of eucalyptus, you know, and, and you know, they're not all bad. They're not, they're not all uh, destructive to our habitat. Finally, Brian, last question. Is there an area on campus that you view as a blank can, uh, canvas or an area where you have dreams of creating something really special? Do you define your your work ambitions in a way that there's something that the campus community might get excited about in the future for what you might be able to create? Every empty plot of land, every bit of turf that's been you know let you know, dry out every, you know, piece of parking lot that goes is a little too extensive. And, you know, every walkway or parkway that could be expanded so much, a little bit more, I have my eye on it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm making mental notes. I'm taking pictures. You know, if I had my brothers, I'd turn the canvas into a, the black forest, you know, like <laughs> it would be so heavily forested. You could barely see the sunlight. Now, not really, but honestly, I, I want to put trees wherever I can, anywhere I can, big trees, small trees, expansive trees, uh, trees that are deciduous, trees that are drought resistant. I want to increase, uh, increase diversity. I want to put out honestly everywhere, everywhere, but that's tough because Caltech, there's a limited space in Caltech. And a lot of that is earmarked for construction purposes, for utility purposes. There's, you know, it's not as simple as putting a tree in the ground. You need to build infrastructure around that tree in order to help it, you know, ensure that it thrives or else all that energy, time and resources that went into putting those trees in will be, you know, for naught if the tree fails or if it, or if it declines rapidly. Brian, this has been a fantastic conversation. I'm so glad we were able to do this and in our own small way, transmit that appreciation for what a beautiful campus we have and all the benefits that confers. I'd like to thank you so much. Thank you. This was such a pleasure to do.